This is the last coffee house, and we are doing our Sam Harris reading list today. These are my favorite episodes. If I could read a book a day, then I do a lot of these things and record and edit and all that stuff. But this one is Against Empathy by Paul Bloom, subtitled The Case for Rational Compassion, published 2016. Paul Bloom is a psychologist. I think he might have some other title as well, but he's a psychologist at least at Yale, and he wrote this book. The content, what is it about? It's about Bloom's case against empathy. He makes a case that empathy is actually a, on balance a bad thing a bad way for humans to do moral reasoning so he starts out he talks about the Newtown shooting uh, and he distinguishes as many people have he distinguishes between something as in your face and close to home as Newtown versus like a shooting that you never hear about and how much you care about those or even if you heard about it in some remote place or not having to do with children in a school those shootings don't resonate in the same way so he talks about how empathy often makes makes the world worse and like I said on balance makes it worse so he doesn't decry all of the possible benefits of empathy he just says on balance it's worse than better he talks about how empathy is biased that it has a bias for short-term thinking versus long-term thinking and you tend to favor one over many I know Sam Harris talked about this at some point he might have talked about it in his episode with Pablo <laughs> but he talked about how if you hear about one person who's in distress like a girl in a well or something like that you're gonna be more empathetic and the more people you hear about, which rationally should mean that you become more concerned and more worried, uh, the less you'll care about it. So you just start, start adding people if they're, you know, twins versus triplets. Uh, you just throw in some other people. When you've got 10 kids in there, then people don't care so much. So here he talks about empathy being biased, which is kind of the most resonant piece that sticks out to me. He talks about how there's a bias for self. So the things that are closer to you, whether they're superficial or more substantive, you know, related to family or whatever else, you're likely to have a bias in that direction when exhibiting empathy. You know, the more likely person you can empathize with are the people who are more like you. And he brings in this distinction between a cognitive empathy versus emotional empathy. One of the, a couple of the examples he uses, he talks about how bullies are good at cognitive empathy, meaning they understand the way a person thinks, he can get into their shoes, so to speak, and therefore be able to hurt that person more. So they're good at that cognitive empathy, but they don't feel the emotional empathy in that they don't have an emotional response to the fact of, oh, that person's hurting, so I have an emotional response. He also references 1984 and how the antagonist O'Brien in that had such a firm grasp of everything that the protagonist was thinking or would hurt the protagonist or how how his mind worked, so that made him a much more effective purveyor of his domination, of his authoritarianism over the protagonist. He brings up this idea of, in talking about empathy, because he talks about how empathy does may have some good effects but on the whole it's bad so he used an analogy to racism like if you could demonstrate that racism had some good effect and I can't remember the example he used but he talked to but it could be something like if a racist is more inclined to support community because <laughs> but they're more inclined to do it because they're racist and just trying to support people who look like them the community gets supported but it's still buttressing a terrible thing that has ter terrible consequences so I just have to interject a little bit but I think racism is one of the dumbest concepts especially as far as the conversation about it goes currently available to human beings anywhere it's something that people don't really use in such a way that it makes any kind of concrete sense it's just hurled around as as a label i don't even mean it in the context of like social justice warriors today i mean it that people just say oh no well, i'm not that without actually understanding what it would mean you know what's the threshold for what being a racist is and are there all sorts of intersections related to okay varying degrees and whether any given threshold meets that varying degree if you just think that 30% of Asian people are bad drivers uh, but it's really 29% okay does that mean you're a racist and it's just it's such a stupid concept because nobody actually gets into any details it's it's one of these concepts where it's just a complete stop at the word because people are so terrified about being morally lambasted or excoriated so therefore they don't have any interest or idea what the term or the concept actually means and that drives 
drives me crazy. But anyway, so as he used it in this particular context, you see what he's getting at. But it's not a great analogy, but uh, you see what he means. He brings in a study, and this uh, studies that seem to support empathy, things like uh, if you're told to put yourself in someone else's shoes, then you tended to give more in this particular study. I would be interested to know whether that actually equates to getting in the space of empathy or whether that's just a moral suggestion. <laughs> a general axiomatic moral suggestion that pushes them one way or the other in a vacuum of information. That's one of the big, I can't get into that right now because it's too complicated. But anyway, so he uh, reemphasizes that empathy is biased, that you don't come to people equally when you're talking about how you can empathize with them, that people who are more likely like you, you're likely to empathize more with them and have more difficulty empathizing with other people. So that could just exacerbate problems that we already have if you're trying to empathize as opposed to use some other method of moralizing. Again, he brings in the emotional versus cognitive empathy idea. He brings up Simon Baron Cohen, who wrote the the Science of Evil. I think it was called. I know I read it at some point, but and I'm gonna read it again. It's part of the reading list. But Cohen has this idea of systematizing versus empathizing men versus women, and that autism people with autism exhibit a high male brain, meaning they highly systematize and can't empathize. Bloom finds this. Uh, Bloom doesn't really buy this so much. He believes that when it comes to psychopathy, it's a matter of they can empathize cognitively, but they can't emotionally. So he's making that distinction. He brings up some problems with studies in general, and I'm sorry, again, I'm still having, you know, it's still May, and apparently this month is just, uh, the allergies bombard me. I never knew, uh, for years and years, I never had any allergies. I never knew this was a sphere of human existence, but now I have to deal with it. Now you have to deal with it because you have to hear me. So I apologize. He talks about problems with studies. So null effects in studies are not published because they're not significant. Why would anybody publish a null effect. This means there's going to be an amplification of where there aren't null effects, even if they're invalid, uh, not null effects. Or other studies show that uh, there's little correlation between empathy and actually doing good. And that I can't remember the details of this particular part. I wrote some notes here, but I'm not sure how to interpret them. So there's one part, one study that empathy only accounts for about 1% of actually doing good. And I, like I said, I can't go into the details. So apologize for that. Obviously, you can read the book if you <laughs> want to go into that brings up some perverse consequences related to empathy. So there was a study where if you identify the particular recipient of some kind of aid or charity, then people are more likely to give more than if you did not identify them ahead of time. So it's the identifiable victim effect, which arguably, and as Bloom argues, isn't a rational response. So you have an identifiable victim, you're more likely to give to them. And it's, it's a weird effect that you need an identifiable identifiable victim to be able to give more money uh, because obviously unidentifiable victims can be much more numerous <laughs> and salient but you will be less inclined to give them aid because they're not identified he brought up how adam smith talked about if there was an earthquake in china it wouldn't even put him off his breakfast it wouldn't bother him you know but if there was something much less significant that happened near him or to somebody he cared about then it would be more significant everybody can empathize with that so effective altruism movement he brought that up and I know Sam Harris was touting this for a little while but it's about being more effective with your charity which I don't mind although I don't like a lot of charity related stuff I think is just you know it's giving the man the fish uh, and it more often misses the point and is about somebody's own sense of I did something I can feel good now opposed to actually solving some kind of a problem identifiable problem so I really think there's some kind of obscurantism that people don't get pass to be able to properly determine the right answer to a problem. And one other part of the effective altruism movement, I liked this because there was a, a greater inclination to help with problems that were man versus nature rather than man versus man. And I don't know all the rationale for this, but it, that's the kind of distinction that makes sense. You know, man versus nature is pretty easy to see <laughs> that if you're going to attribute fault anywhere, you could just give it to nature and then move on to trying to help somebody. Man versus man is going to be more complex. So brings up a Nazi euthanization of people with learning disabilities. He brought up a study. I know somebody brought the study and called it an irrefutable cost-benefit result, you know, if you just look at the cost-benefit, which, of course, an incredibly superficial way to look at that kind of a, an analysis of just trying to look at the cost-benefit when you're talking about moral questions. And I really, this is probably the thing I get most sick of, where people just make these intuitive moral judgments and just say, okay, well, this is right, therefore, and just start reasoning 
on the back of that. Euthanizing people with learning disabilities can be much more costly in ways that you have no idea how to quantify than simply, oh, we have fewer people to feed or something like that. So it's just, it annoys me. I mean, something like euthanizing portions of your population for not being smart enough. <laughs> that could have monstrous psychological damaging effects on kids who are just trying to go to school and learn something. Like if I if I get this test too wrong, are they gonna euthanize me? There are a whole bunch of other costs that can absolutely destroy any idea about euthanizing people when you're just dispassionately looking at it as opposed to, oh, I have to have some normative moral sense uh, intuitively of what should be right and what should be wrong. It, it just annoys me when they get into these kinds of diatribes. It, it sounds Sounds like religious reasoning when we don't have to go there. And I don't know, are people just too stupid to think in these terms? Uh, to think like, okay, well, we want to maximize human health or well-being or whatever else, so let's just follow that down the rabbit hole? As opposed to, I need some kind of a thing in the back of my head that prevents me from... <laughs> murdering people or euthanizing people. I don't know what, what the problem is here. Bloom talks about how liberals are more empathic. He's concerned over something called unmitigated communion, if I remember this correctly. And some of the examples, I don't know if they come later, but he talks about how if you over empathize with children, then their short term, you know, immediate pain over not getting the sugary treat or having cake instead of... Uh, you know, a nice rounded meal, your over-empathizing with them could be damaging to them or them not wanting to be stuck with a needle. Your over-empathizing can be damaging long-term. So that was brought up at some point. He brought up some weird outlier people who are so empathetic they don't take care of their own needs. So they just over-empathize with everybody everywhere. And I'm sure this is not of statistical significance. So it's not something we really need to worry about. But there are people, there are people who excessively empathize and disregard their own needs. And there's a gender difference, so women on average are more empathetic than men. Which could be a horrible, misandrous slight against men, or it could just be reality. He gets into altruism and evolution, and I, this topic also drives me absolutely crazy, because nobody defines anything well, or knows what the hell they're talking about when it comes to actually making demarcations between, okay, what are genes, and what are genes doing, and what's psychology, and what's society, and being socialized, and all, having those kinds of demarcations just to talk reasonably about these topics, but it's just, you'll talk about something like sex, and he says, okay, well, you don't, you don't do things for your individual genes, or altruism is fine, it's not actually that you're, that's what he was getting at, he was trying to say, but so what Bloom is arguing here is that you could still have this special sense of altruism, is that you're not actually doing things for your genes, which is what most people say, it's all just selfish gene activity, it, it doesn't have anything to do with some metaphysically important idea of people just being altruists to be altruists, that it's just about selfish doing things for your genes. He's saying that no, you can still be metaphysically altruist because when you're doing altruistic things, you're not actually thinking about your genes. Just like if you're thinking about sex, you're not actually thinking about survival and reproduction. <laughs> it's just, you have to define all the stuff that you're talking about. It's so childishly sophomoric to just race through this kind of a complex topic and just say, look, I've, I've created a binary and I'm selecting one side of the binary just so I can go against received wisdom related to whether people are selfish or not because you have to go down the line okay well if, if you're not doing it for your genes what are you doing it for it's just you have a general sense of you want to be altruistic okay why uh, just it's built in there okay why because of evolution okay well isn't that just protecting your genes and when he talks about you're not thinking about survival and reproduction when you're thinking about sex why would it be the case that there's some kind of a fundamental metaphysical importance to you saying, I'm doing it for love or pleasure. That's the reason I'm doing it for sex. Okay, why? And you keep going down the line. It's just really annoying when they set up these binaries and especially when it comes to something like evolution and human psychology and morality and motivations, free will, agency, all that stuff. And you just package it all together and just pick one side and say, done, I've made the argument. It's such childish nonsense. So evolutionary biologists, evolutionary psychologists, psychologists, everybody needs to get on that <laughs> and define these things better so we don't have these 
dumbass conversations about this kind of stuff. Moving on, so evil and morality, uh, he talked about his own moral views. Again, I don't care. I don't care what anybody's intuitive sense of what's correct and what's incorrect morally happens to be. It's meaningless. He talks about dehumanizing people a little bit, a lack of autonomy. Uh, he brings up pornography and how how women are depicted as lesser in pornography. I really, this is another one of those things, uh, things that people just trot out. I don't know how much study has actually been done about how much it changes male behavior like they watch <laughs> they watch some pornography and they go to Starbucks the next day and they're talking to the barista like you're dehumanized <laughs> <laughs> it's such pop psychology where it's just like, oh no, these women have been dehumanized because guys watch them in sexual situations digitally <laughs> because they want to jerk off or whatever. I just, uh, there are so many complex things going on with that little <laughs> interaction that it's just, it's really frustrating that people just kind of throw these things out in a haphazard way. So I'm not necessarily defending it in general, but I just, I get so sick of any of these sociological conclusions conclusions that are drawn about hundreds of millions of parts. I mean, they could have hundreds of millions of moving parts that you actually have to quantify and understand, and yet they just kind of gloss over all of that and just say, they're dehumanized. <laughs> It's so stupid. Anyway, uh, he brings up, he says how empathy blocks dehumanizing, and that's, I think he th thought that was a positive aspect of empathy, that it blocks that, but it's still more likely to block dehumanizing of people who are more like you. Uh, he talks about righteous anger and how it, it can lead to good things. I, it's hugely skeptical of how righteous anger, why not just dispassionate determination what's actually true, rather than righteous anger. He talks about how that can lead to good things. I mean, especially his story. Historically, when you talk about just competing angers, <laughs> competing emotions, then you could see how it would work, that you could have a righteous anger lead to some positive change, but it could be the same thing as using racism for something positive. Why should you need it at all? And I think he had a position of that we're not as stupid as they say we are. I think we're way more stupid than... <laughs> <laughs> than even the most cynical person when it comes to human intelligence. We're way more stupid than that. I really don't think people have the slightest freaking clue why they do what they do. They're just lucky to have several million years behind them that's pushing them in directions that have worked historically. I don't think people have a clue what the hell is going on. I think we're much more stupid than we think we are. So, oh, he brings up this case of a tumor that was causing sex addiction. So this guy was addicted to... I don't know why there's so much sex talk throughout this book. There's a lot. I didn't bring up a good chunk of it, but it comes up a lot. But there's this, what, it caused sex addiction. The guy got into all sorts of weird stuff. It turned out he had a tumor. When they removed the tumor, he stopped being addicted and then it started to grow back. He became addicted again. They removed it again and he stopped. I think Bloom was positing here some kind of a, a normal range for human beings. So it's not that everybody has a tumor pushing them out into the moral morass, <laughs> into the wilderness. And there's, but there's some kind of a normal where everybody just kind of functions. Uh, I don't I don't know how useful this is. He talked about how the prison threat didn't motivate this guy because he had the tumor there, but obviously for people with really low IQ or <laughs> people who are overly aggressive or a, mere, a million other different inputs, prison the prison threat won't motivate them either. So does that put them outside in normal psychology? I just, ugh. I don't know. I don't know how useful that actually is. But uh, obviously there are instances, I know Sam Harris loves this one example, and both these are of course anecdotal, but Sam Harris loves this example of this guy who started picking people off and he said something to somebody about how they need to look at his brain because he felt you know, something was wrong. And when they looked at his brain, he had a huge tumor on his pituitary gland or something like that. So, so yeah, it can happen, but we still barely understand how psychology works in general. So just going straight to the tumors, uh, I think is not not particularly useful. So, Against Empathy by Paul Bloom. Uh, there were a couple of critical responses, <laughs> and this is just, like, I usually pick negative responses so I can defend the book a bit because I just went through trashing it, you know? So, because <laughs> I don't want it to seem like that's all I want to do is trash it. Obviously, he's doing a hell of a lot more than most people when it comes to trying to figure out this topic. He actually wrote a book on it, so I appreciate that. Critical Responses, and this is by Sally Vickers. I think this is in The Guardian, and she talks, he, her whole beef with the concept of 
of empathy was what's wrong with sympathy which I mean, is just pointless obviously bloom is specifically talking about okay we're carving out a, a difference between sympathy and empathy empathy is specifically feeling the other person's pain as opposed to sympathy which is just feeling bad for somebody else and empathy is stepping into their shoes as opposed to just staying away but being like oh that's too bad for you so he's specifically positing that there's a difference between these and then analyzing the way that works oh and then she gets it like one of the sentences when she's like summing up the whole thing she says a sympathetic understanding is an imaginative attempt to sense another's otherness without purporting to appropriate or own their existential uniqueness I just, I, if you could see my face right now, I, I, that's just Deepak Chopra level nothing. It's why say that sentence? There was more of it, but it's just, that wasn't contributing anything to anything. So it just, uh, put me back in a space of thank you, Paul Bloom, for actually making an effort. So I appreciate that. Uh, my response now, I did a lot of this as I was going through it, but so I appreciate the distinction between emotional and cognitive empathy. Like I said, he makes a reasonable case to have that distinction between emotional and cognitive empathy. The, I wonder if a better way to do it would be to control for emotion, someone being emotional in general, and then determining whether there really is a distinction between emotional and cognitive empathy. Because obviously for psychopaths, if they're just plain not emotional... <laughs> then it's not really a matter of the empathy being cognitive versus, you know, emotional empathy. It's just a matter of people being emotional versus emotional versus not emotional and exhibiting empathy versus not exhibiting empathy. So I, I don't know if those controls were in place for purposes of this, but, and like I said, the empathy, sympathy difference seems reasonable. I'm not sure if we have a sufficient understanding of human psychology to make meaningful distinctions along these lines, but uh, it seemed reasonable as he proposed it and, and set it forth. And my fundamental interest and concern is, is about bias. So when you're exhibiting empathy, you still maintain all of the individual biases that you would anyway. If you're trying to jump in somebody else's shoes, you know, if you could really take their personality on, you're just going to inherit all their biases. And if it's just you in their shoes, what you would feel related to that, you're just exhibiting your own biases. And I think people are fundamentally biased and they're fundamentally going to do that. And that's the worst way to try to figure something out, to figure out the the actual answer to a question is to just sit in your shoes and say okay well what do i think and go along all your biases it's just really frustratingly <laughs> limited and it's going to cause more problems so people get over your damn biases more importantly since you don't really have a metric for being able to do that or understand that you've done that uh, just have a whole hell of a lot of humility when it comes to any position that you want to hold especially if there's going to be some kind of behavior attached including voting so and and I do get I get really annoyed by anecdotes and I know that's a method a sales method because you want to put okay first thing in the book is going to be this anecdote about this thing that's exhibiting my point but I get really annoyed because obviously we shouldn't be talking in those terms I see it so much what I see people arguing on TV well my friend <laughs> I have a friend who was like this which discounts your entire point and I know <laughs> an illegal immigrant who's great you know that kind of thing so it's anecdotes should make up extreme extremely little of any kind of a case you're making for anything and he like I said he talks about my own moral sense uh, I don't care I don't care what your own intuitive moral sense is on any given thing I think it's it's pretty much empty filler nothing unless somebody specifically asked you or the point is to find out the anecdotal sense of a person for some other reason I don't know but otherwise just my own moral sense who cares uh, and there were a lot of vague conclusions made based on limited evidence and you know it would take going through each one of them to show what's vague about this what's vague about the defining what's vague about the connection of study to conclusion or whatever else but there were just a lot of vague conclusions that deal with concepts that have millions of moving parts but just draw these broad conclusions so that's paul blooms against empathy okay so i mean it has some good stuff in it but there there just doesn't seem to be enough meat <laughs> to actually like have a revelatory experience while reading this book uh, which is is too bad but at least he's bringing to the fore being suspicious of empathy in general I think it's a it's an incredibly dangerous concept just based on all of the various problems that arise related to it and I th I don't think it's as useful as people think uh, why can't we just think about things in terms of okay well this is gonna cause a, a negative consequence so maybe I won't do that why can't we think in those kinds of terms instead of having 
going to go through this mediator of, oh, now I feel a thing that makes me feel bad because that person feels bad and therefore I'm going to do something. It's just, they're better ways. They're better ways. Okay, but that's that's against empathy. You know, if you're interested in the topic, then you can give it a read. I'm hoping that we get more technical kinds of books around these topics. I don't know if even the scholarship itself is particularly technical given where psychology kind of is. <laughs> as a discipline but you know hopefully we get some more technical stuff where we can really get some answers but that's that's it that's the last coffee house that's sam harris reading list and i appreciate it okay bye (laughs) 